Do you think you were underrated as a player? Yes, I think I was. Letizier. here he is, Matt Letizier. And I played the best football of my life. I, I loved winning. We've kind of gone away from looking at talented players and letting them do their thing. And Jack Grealish is a perfect example of that. So what sort of younger players are you really excited to see over the next 10 years or so? Jude Bellingham, for me, is mm. just... Wow. Years ago, all the clubs held the power. Yeah. The player now has all the power. If you're a really good player, you yeah. have all the power. And it basically all ended with about a four-minute Zoom call. There's no more work for you here at Sky, so uh, we're going to terminate your contract. The, the techniques that have been used to propagandise people have been used deliberately to sow division. You are frightened to give an opinion on something because you're going to get cancelled. I never thought that I would feel like that in this country. Without free speech, there's a real opportunity for a tyrannical government to take over. Matt Letizia is an all-time Premier League great footballer. He reveals the truth about being sacked from Sky. We go down the rabbit hole on free speech and so much more. So please make sure you like, subscribe and hit the notification bell so you never miss another episode. Okay, so I've heard you say on a, on a previous interview that you always saw football as entertainment not just a absolute win at all costs yeah. kind of setup mm. and i'd be curious to know why do you think you thought that way why why did you think that way whereas other people thought differently um because when i was growing up as a kid um i watched football and i i wanted to be entertained by it and i found myself being entertained by it mm. and the players that i really enjoyed watching when I was growing up, were people like Glenn Hoddle, who was my, my hero, I was a Spurs fan as a kid, uh, Liam Brady, you know, people who kind of made the game look easy mm. um, and made it look effortless. Uh, and so I always, I always viewed football as an entertainment industry. Um, and I took that attitude into, into my career, even though, you know, a lot of footballers are very much kind of, you know, we've got to win, got to win, got to win. Um, I didn't really, I didn't really see football that way. I, I felt like I'd won if I'd done something on a football pitch that everybody in the crowd had kind of got up off their seat mm -hmm. and clapped and, yeah. and felt like they'd seen something that not everyone could do. Um, and that made me, that made me feel good. So I always wanted to entertain people first and foremost. Yes, I, I loved winning. Yeah. You know, all sportsmen love winning. Uh, win, winning, and I do have. You know, I, I'm 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 a pretty bad loser. I don't <laughs> I don't always show it. Yeah. I don't like losing. I yeah. don't like losing. But ultimately, for me, football was about entertaining people. They pay a lot of money to go mm. and watch the sport that they love. Yes, they support their team, but they also feel like. If you're paying that much money, you don't, you don't want to come away at the end of it. You know, if you if your team have like nicked a one nil win by a fluky goal, and you haven't seen anything that's got you up off your seat the whole ninety minutes yeah. or a hundred minutes as it is these days, yeah. um, and and that was kind of I don't know that that was just my take on what football should be. Um, you know, I, I grew up um, uh, on a tiny island of, of Guernsey, and it was a very laid back place, and I kind of kind of always taken that laid back attitude with me into into everything that I've pretty much done in life to be honest did, did that lead to conflict Does, did you have teammates or people thinking you're not taking it as seriously because you had that attitude did that, that create issues uh, it probably did actually on, on occasions um, I, I think there was probably times where when managers perhaps thought that I wasn't contributing enough to the team hmm. Uh, because you know I wasn't the type of player that was going to run around like a headless chicken for ninety minutes. That wasn't me. Um, so yeah, there were definitely times when managers would would question whether you know they should have me in the team because of my attitude towards the game. Um, however, my my argument against that would be that the one manager who who actually said to me, you know, I don't want you defending because you're not very good at that. <laughs> yeah. uh, he said, I, but I want you to go and do what you're good at and, and I'll give you a pretty much a free role in the team. Uh, so he set up the team, put me in the middle of the pitch and just told all the other players, this is Alan Ball, told all the other players to, to just 
whenever they get the ball, can they pass it to me? Because I was the best player in the team. Um, and so my argument against that is that when a manager did that to me, mm-hmm. I repaid him with 45 goals in 64 games, plus countless assists in that time as well. And I played the best football of my life, my career, when I had a manager who just said, go and do what you're good at. Yeah. So that would be my argument against <clears throat> that. Uh, and, and there were times, again, when teammates actually um, were, would question why I, would, why I should be in the team. Um, because, you know, footballers go through spells of yeah. good form, spells of bad form. Um, so when I had my spells where I wasn't scoring loads of goals or I wasn't creating loads of goals, uh, obviously because I didn't have then the headless chicken mentality to fall back on, um, people would be questioning wh- whether I should be in the team or not, rather than actually saying to me, oh, well, just go and do what you're good at. Mm. Instead of trying to get me to do all the stuff that I'm not very good at. Um, so, yeah, that, and there were times, I remember one occasion actually when um, I was playing a pre season friendly out in Sweden, I think we were. And kind of, it was against a, like a local team, they weren't very good. Um, and it was, yeah, it was a pre season friendly. We were winning it quite comfortably. And in the first half, I remember I'd given the ball away and then the team had broken on us and I didn't really kind of chase back very much afterwards. And one of our centre-backs, a guy called Kevin Moore, is no longer with us, God bless his soul. Um, uh, he, he he was a bit upset that I hadn't chased back and he'd give me a right bollocking on the pitch yeah. in the first half. And um, and, and I kind of... I, I didn't want to argue with him because he was a senior professional. I didn't want to argue with him. Um, so I kind of just said nothing and I, and I left it and... I think he, he kind of must have, the fact that I didn't acknowledge him or, or kind of wound him up a little bit. So when yeah. we go back in, so when we're sat in a half time, we go back in the change room. Well, he's number six, I'm number seven in the team when we had proper numbers back in those mm. days. And so we're sat next to each other in the in the changing room and at half time. So I've got this LucasAid bottle, this, which I don't know if you remember the LucasAid bottles, they had a little ring on the top and you just pull it and then you, yeah. you drink it out of the ring. So I'm sat next to him and he's, I can see he's desperate to, to have another go at me and I'm just trying to ignore him. So I'm looking straight ahead. I'm not trying to catch his eye or anything like that. So, and, and then he starts saying stuff and I'm just looking straight ahead. I don't want to, I don't want to get involved. Don't want to get involved. And, um, and it, it's obviously winding him up that I'm not biting or anything. I'm just looking straight ahead. I'm not engaging him. And, um, and so I took a sip of my LucasAid like this. And as I did that, <laughs> he smacked the LucasAid bottle out my mouth. Right, and yeah. he, he went, listen to me, and he smacked the and the, the lip of the Lucase ball as it flicked out my mouth, caught my caught my lip, and all of a sudden Ooh. there's blood all over the blood all over my shirt, and my mouth is just streaming with blood. So um, I mean, it wasn't it wasn't bad just because where it was, it was it almost it looked like he just painful, absolutely leathered you. But he, yeah, 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 just it, it looked like that. <laughs> yeah, um, but yeah, that was just kind of one occasion where where a teammate didn't really kind of get. Yeah. my attitude towards football yeah it was yeah. a pre-season friendly it didn't really matter that much so I didn't chase back that was me but he was proper consummate professional he trained exactly the same way as he played I I, I didn't um, yeah. I was quite happy to train at kind of 90% and then when the game comes around that's when you find your extra bit And um, but everyone's different and uh, yeah that's, that's personality type as well, isn't it? Like, you know, I play at a very low level, six aside on, you know, a couple of times a week. And we have yeah. a couple of people that play with us that we could be 10 nil down a six aside game that doesn't matter at all. And they're having a go at people for not working out. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, so I can only imagine that at an actual proper high level that you yeah. know, people are going are gonna to go that way. I mean, do, do you think football's gone too much that way in terms of moving away from players, you know, like yourself and the ones that you really liked? And it's more, much more about the system and covering distance and that sort of thing now yeah um i do think it's kind of gotten away from the skill in the game and Mm. it's gone to athleticism and it's gone to as you say the systems um you know the managers try to i think the managers try to make it all about them um so you know they'll come up with these formations so that you know if they if they win a game the managers can go well you know I played this formation and uh, <laughs> look how great I am. <laughs> Nothing to do with them nuggets on the pitch. It's just me. Yeah. Uh, that I kind of get that impression from some managers that they don't 
want it to be about their players, mm. um, which I kind of don't. I I don't really appreciate that. I think football's about the, the players that are on the pitch. Mm. Um, yes, the manager can have a, a an, an impact, but at the end of the day. The people that are paying their money to come and watch a game of football, they don't pay their money to watch the manager stand on the sideline waving his arms about changing formations. They yeah. pay to be entertained by the players on the pitch. And uh, so, yeah, I, th I think we've kind of gone away from uh, actually looking at talented players and letting them do their thing, um, and actually gone to well, this is the system and this is how I play. If you don't play that way, you ain't going to get a game. Um, and Jack Grealish is a perfect example of that. If you look at Jack Grealish as a player at Aston Villa and compare him to the Jack Grealish now, there's no comparison. You know, he's a completely different player, and he's had to f tone down his dribbling ability and the way that he was playing at Villa to fit into a system. Uh, which, if he didn't do that, he wasn't going to get a game. So, yeah, I, I, it's not something about the modern game that I'm particularly enamoured by. That's, that's literally the exact example. As you were saying that, I was thinking of the Jack Grealish example, thinking perfect of what you're saying there. Aston Villa, he was the guy. It was like what you described. It was get the ball to him yeah, when he played absolutely. in that team and see what he can do. Yeah. And um, and yeah, now very much doesn't seem that way. And it's, you know, obviously when well, Man City are his team is incredible. But for me, just as a fan, someone who's not involved in football, I don't often find their games that interesting. Yeah. I, I know yeah. they're designed for control yeah. and that's the idea, but I want chaos. Like yeah, I'm yeah. a fan. I, like, I, yeah, I, want, I, like I, want chaos. I want excitement. I want a ball exactly. put in the box. I want yeah. to see, you know, chances created. I don't want to, I don't want to see 10 minutes of possession and then at the end of it, you know, maybe have a shot, you know, yeah. I'm like, come on. And this is what, one of the really things that frustrates me the most about today's football is that even when a team are one nil down, with like five minutes left. Yeah. They are still <laughs> passing it around at the back for five minutes before actually getting it somewhere near the opposition goal to try and create a chance. And it just drives me mad. My own team do it. You know, Southampton do it. They're just so obsessed with possession and control that they kind of forget about the fact that actually the game is about scoring goals and creating chances. And the more chances you create, the more chance you've got of scoring a goal. Not having... 80% possession, but three shots on target in the whole match doesn't do anyone any good. Yeah, yeah, I I, I felt that way. Uh, there's an interesting quote, I, I can't remember who said it, but it was it was talking it was talking about business specifically, but they were saying that if you show, um, show me what the world looked like when someone was 20, and that's often what their view will be for the rest of their lives. Like they're sort of, they were designed for what the world looked like when they were 20, and it, it, it was used in a business context in that sense. But I think it probably applies to football as well. It's almost like, what was football like when you were 20? That's probably the type of football that you like and will like uh, going on. Yeah. And I, I, I struggle a bit with inverted wingers and think that I know that they're retaining possession better. I know that they can cut in and shoot and they're more likely to score a goal. But it seems just, get less chaos if you have the right-footed winger on the you know growing up watching man united you know you've got gigs and becks yeah, and, yeah. and like yes i understand the xg is less if they just put the ball in really quickly but it's fun because it's going in there and you think yeah, yeah. what's going to happen chaos and it feels like something can happen yeah you know and mistakes can be made that's the other thing that they're they're almost too intent on scoring the perfect goal yeah whereas you've almost taken out of play the fact that you can force your opposition into making mistakes just by creating pressure on their goal. Mm. Um, and kind of that that's almost been taken out the game a little bit because they're so obsessed with keeping possession, keeping possession, and we're going to score the perfect goal. We're going to have 48 passes. We're going to get to the byline. We're going to cut it back and someone's going to side foot it in there, which looks lovely when it happens. It doesn't happen that often. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, and, and like you, I, I prefer, even though I'm a, a purist who, you know, I love the ball being played on the deck. I love all that. But there's a time in a football match where you have to put pressure on the opposition goal and not just keep possession and keep possession and probe and probe and probe. Um, you know, you could spend 90 minutes doing that and never have a shot on goal mm -hmm. and, and come out of the game with 80% possession and get beat 1-0 on a counter-attack, yeah. you know. Um, so, yeah, I, I prefer the chaos and I prefer the ball in the box a lot more than it is. Are there players that you see now that are of that type that you described, like as you were as a player, that the first responsibility wasn't, 
kilometers covered in a game and it's more of a allowed to play not necessarily track back as much are there ones that you think that's a good example or are we are we really losing those uh, those types um I think Grealish was yeah. at Aston Villa. Um, he's no longer anymore. I think there's, there's not that many that I can think of in the Premier League. I'm, I really struggle to mm. to think of a player that is kind of in in the mould that I was. Um, and that that I don't know if that sounds arrogant at all, or if that's even a good thing. Um, <laughs> uh, but I've always really I've always found it hard when people have said to me, "Who do you see?" in the Premier League that most reminds you of you yeah um, and I all for the last 20 years I've really struggled to to say and the, the one that I came up with actually it's played in a slightly different position than me uh, but it was Dimitar Berbatov mm. so he was um, he was one of those guys that I felt like when he when the ball arrived at his feet it felt like the entire game slowed down yeah and everyone else had to play at his pace. <laughs> yeah. uh, and that's a real art. There's mm. a real skill to that. Uh, and I felt like he was the one person that I looked at and thought, okay, I, I see a bit of a bit of a similarity there. You know, mm. neither of us were blessed with great pace, mm. but we were great, blessed with a, a great first touch and a great ability to see a pass and to, to score a goal. So kind of he's, he's the one over the years that I kind of would have said. I guess to some extent that comes from not having the pace because you need to find another Absolutely. way. You need to be, if if from when you were six years old, you could just knock the ball past anyone and get round them, you probably didn't need to develop the yeah. that like silky touch and that that skill and that. I think one style. of the, one of the things that helped me when I was growing up in that respect is that um, I've got three older brothers who are four, mm. six, and seven years older than me, um, and so growing up, I was always playing with them and their mates. Yeah. So I had to find, so they were always bigger and stronger and faster than me. Yeah. I had to find a way to get involved in the game and, you know, find a different way to be able to get past people. And that's what I did. That's really interesting. And I imagine now in the in the academies, they are looking at, you know, I, you, you, I could always imagine a situation, I don't know, the, in a working setting, but I could imagine a situation where they're assessing the kids going through the, the ages and, maybe even before they look at some of the technical skills, they're going on the metrics of, you know, what's top speed, all these things, what, what's the average distance covered in this sort of scenario and yeah. just those sort of pure, uh, kind of like an American sport yeah, way of doing things. it's got things. very data-driven. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I mean, it's been incredible. I mean, there was very little in terms of data that we kind of used. Mm. I mean, there was no, hardly any sports science around back in those <laughs> days. Kind of started coming in the last two or three years um, of my career, but it was kind of negligible and it didn't really make uh, a whole lot of difference. People didn't actually take that much notice of the sports scientists back then. <laughs> uh, and now it's like they're these demigods going, yeah. oh, well, you can't play today because you're in the red zone. And, you know, you we've, we've been monitoring your heart rate and, you know, we don't think you're quite quite right to play in this. And it's like, okay, why don't you just ask the player how he feels? Because <laughs> yeah. he probably knows how he feels more than your data. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, a bit, a bit of common sense, and he's living in his sense. body yeah, and yeah. been doing it all the time. So, with that in mind, how how do you think you would get on if you know if you were starting your career now? Do you think? Uh, well, I'd have to do things probably a lot differently than what I did yeah. to to get into the world of football. Um, so, I think I would have had to have adapted. I'd have probably had to have been more focused on on fitness to be able to get myself in the position to play. I think once because of my mindset, I think I would have I would have made sure I did everything right to get to where I wanted to be. And then where I got to where I wanted to be, I would have then played how I wanted to play. Yeah. Gotcha. And then let the results of what I was doing determine whether or not I, I would stay in the team. Mm. Um, I kind of liken it to uh, to passing your driving test. Right, you know, so you do do everything right to get, to get your license, that. yeah, yeah, and then when you got your license, <laughs> off you go. <laughs> yeah. Just don't get caught. <laughs> yeah, and almost no one who has a license could pass the test again if they took it. Absolutely, you know, more than yeah. a few weeks after they originally got their license. So yeah, yeah. definitely, I know exactly what you mean there. Yeah. yeah. 
We'll get back to our conversation with Matt in a second. Before I do, I want to quickly let you know how my company can help you if you own your own business. So my company is a marketing agency. We run advertising campaigns for clients across various different social channels. If that's something you're interested in, there is a link in the video description. You can click on that and book a free call with one of my team members. Hopefully we get a chance to work together. Let's get back to the conversation with Matt. Uh, do you think you'd enjoy it as much if you were a, a pro now? Do you think it would have been more fun back when you uh, I, I don't think I would. I think... I don't think it's it's as much fun now. I don't think I think people take it far too seriously now. Mm. Um, you know, because at the end of the day, uh, it is an entertainment industry. You that's what you're there for. Um, and I find it really tough when I see players and I see players interviewed, and I and I read them. You know, they do articles and they say, oh, "I don't really, I don't really like football, but I'm good at it, so I do it." <laughs> <That's> <laughs> and cool. I'm, I'm like. What? Yeah. <laughs> what? What's your point in life if you're not doing something that you can enjoy? Yeah. You know, if you're not enjoying your job, go go do something else. Yeah. Go some, find something that you do enjoy, because uh, you ain't on this planet for that long. So why not make the most of it while you're here? Yeah, and I guess they probably just had the athletic attributes and they were yeah. kind of good at it and, and could do it. And, and there's the, so much money now. And the isn't money, there, yeah, you exactly. can't. You that's can't the, say no that's to the it. thing. Um, the money is is very very tempting, um, and you know. I guess you can understand if they want to do that for a short period and make sure, you know, for the rest of their life, their family don't have to worry about yeah. money. Um, that's their choice. It wouldn't be the choice that I made. Um, uh, because as I said, I, I kind of had a um, an attitude towards life that, you know, I, I always remember when I was growing up, my uncle once said to me, he said, um, he said, we're here for a good time, not a long time. Mm. Uh, and those words have stuck in my mind since I was a teenage boy. Um, and they've always been at the heart of every decision I ever made. Oh yeah, I like that one. That's uh, here for a good time, not a long time. That's mm. it's good to remember and um, going through. I guess as well with the with the current players, they they probably can't do anywhere near as much as players of your generation did. There's everyone's got a phone in their pocket and it can be distributed within yeah. minutes. And, Absolutely, um, it's a it's a ho- it's a horrible world mm. to to live in. It's a proper goldfish bowl now. Um, yeah. you know. It, Again, I wouldn't, I wouldn't change the era that I played in, even for the money that's available. I was going to say, maybe, maybe just change the paychecks round. So that- <laughs> yeah, you know, if that was the choice, I'd, I'd choose my era because, yeah. like I say, we we were able to still have a life outside of football, yeah. and still have fun, and still do things that were probably, you know, maybe something that you probably shouldn't have done, but it was good fun, <laughs> and you could get away with it. Um, you know, and, and I think I, I feel a little bit sorry, uh, sorry for the boys these days. Who, yes, they have everything, you know, materialistically. Um, but will you see any of them in 10 or 15 years' time on the after dinner speaking circuit telling the stories of, mm. of their career and what they, what they got up to? Yeah. Um, and you kind of just won't. I don't think they've had the, the same kind of experiences that perhaps we did. I think I, I've wondered that a number of times because I've been to you know, number, dinners, after dinner speaking. Um, a lot of ex-sportsmen come up with it's footballers, rugby players, etc. And they've all got these amazing stories because they're of a generation when they did something. I mean, yeah, and I've thought that before. I think in Where's the 15 next generation years time, of speakers going to be? They're like, well, we, we worked really, really hard and we ate everything we should eat and yeah. nothing we shouldn't eat. And, and I earned a lot of money. Yeah, they had a lot of money. <laughs> and I got a bunch of Instagram followers. <laughs> I'm not sure that's going to keep people entertained, you know. Yeah, funny old world. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to ask you about, you know, one of the things... Uh, from a marketing background, very interested in, in branding and, and and personal brands. We're seeing that so much more creeping into like the advertising space, the marketing space, the ability of people who are known to be able to use that influence to sell products and whatever. I feel like you have one of the most unique personal brands in football, particularly in this country, in that you're always the example used, from what I see, of someone who had the talent to go and play for one of the biggest clubs in the world but chose to, to stay at Southampton. Yep. And often when there are players that people talk about as talented enough to, to take that next step at a you know a smaller Premier League club, let's say, you're always the example that people are given that you could choose to, to be like Matt Letizia and stay yeah. and, and, and things like that. So I wanted to I wanted to first ask you about why you didn't leave. Yep. And there's obviously some, some interesting things off the back of that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so there were uh, different reasons at different times. Um, I, I had a chance to join Spurs when I was 21 mm. uh, and was interested. Uh, I spoke to Spurs. They were only, they were the only team I ever spoke to. I actually had a meeting with them 
uh, up in North London where we kind of talked terms on the contract and agreed the terms of the contract and I actually signed the contract uh, which was obviously illegal at the time because <laughs> still the contract to sell Southampton yeah, yeah. Um, but the, the idea was that that contract was then locked away uh, and would only be bought out at the end of the season once the two clubs had agreed a fee that was the that was the plan um, I was due to be married at the end of that season the 89-90 season and uh, uh, and a couple of weeks before the end of the season my fiance decided she didn't want to go live in London so <laughs> I had a decision to make and, you know, I either got married or, or joined Spurs. So uh, I did get married. Uh, six years later, I was divorced, but, you know, <laughs> shit happens. Um, uh, but to this day, and, and honestly, with my hand on my heart, I made that decision. So I, I had the choice. I made the choice. Yeah. And to this day, I don't have a single regret about the decisions I made. Um, you know, I turned down Liverpool in the early 90s. Um, you know, they were one of the biggest teams in, in Europe. Uh, at that point probably in the world um, they were kind of just starting to you know the domination from the 70s yeah. and 80s was just starting to wane a little bit um, but I, I wasn't really interested in kind of basically kind of living in the north of England <laughs> quite frankly uh, I, I like the, I like the warmth and, <laughs> yeah, yeah. you know um, and so I wasn't really interested in, in, in going to, to play up north on a regular basis Um and then in 1995, Chelsea tried to buy me, um, uh, and that that was a that was an interesting one because um, Glenn Hoddle was manager of Chelsea at the time, okay. who was obviously my hero. Mm. Um, and uh, actually, when when the Spurs thing happened in 1990, Terry Venables was manager of Spurs, mm. and um, so when I changed my mind, I told I rang my agent up and I said, you know, I'm not going to go, and he was like, okay, I'll, I'll tell him. So. Uh, he rang Spurs, told him that I wasn't going to go. He rang me back and he went, Terry Venables wants to speak to you. <laughs> so he wants to try and convince you to, to yeah. still come. And I went, no, I've made up my mind. I don't want to talk to him. Wow. So I, so I blanked Terry. <laughs> then he became England manager a few years later. Uh, and then in 1995, when Glenn was in charge, Matthew Harding, uh, who was director at, at Chelsea at the time, he's got the... One of the stands named after him, I think, at mm. Stamford Bridge now, and he obviously passed away in a helicopter crash a couple of years after this incident. But he was a big fan of mine. He desperately wanted me to get to go to right. Chelsea, so he rang up Laurie McMenemy, who was director of football at, at Southampton, and uh, this was in April '95. And he said, "Laurie he said we want to buy Matt Letizia. and and Laurie, being Laurie, went, well, "We don't want to sell him." <laughs> He said, and Laurie said, and I know the lad's happy here. He said, so uh, he said, you've got no chance. He said, in fact, the only way Matt Letizia will ever be your player is if you buy Southampton Football Club. <laughs> and Matthew Harding turned around and went, oh, that's a good idea. He said, I could I could buy them and change their name to Chelsea on Sea. <laughs> so, uh, so anyway, the conversation ended. Laurie thought nothing more of it. And a couple of days later in the post, Laurie received uh, an envelope um, and uh, he opened it up and inside it was a cheque. Uh, and the cheque was made out to Chelsea on sea uh, for £7 million, which was a lot of money in 1995. Yeah. And it was signed by Matthew Harding. Brilliant. And Laurie had kept this cheque all these years in a little little frame. Uh, and a few years ago, he, he gave it to me. He said, oh, you know, this was about you. He said, you should have this. So in my office at home, I've got a, I've got a cheque for £7 million quid signed by Matthew Harding. I uh, uh, can't tell you how frustrating he is looking at that every day knowing he can't catch it. <laughs> you can't just get a little company called I Chelsea know, on sea. I about that. <laughs> oh, and then, oh wow, that's a great, that, so, that is a great story. So yeah, and then obviously Glenn was, so when I when I said no, my agent rang me and said, oh, you know, Chelsea want to buy you and I went, yeah. I'm not interested. Um, he rang me back again and he went, Glenn Hoddle wants to speak to you. Yeah. Now, after like that, oh my God. <laughs> Yeah, so I was like, uh, I said, no, I said, I've made my decision. I, I don't want to speak to him. Yeah, and um, and about a year after that, he became England manager. <laughs> so I was like, I just blanked the two England managers of the nineties, which kind of during the best period of time in my career, uh, and I blanked both of them. And that might be why I only ended up with eight caps. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but well, you can't know those things at the time. I no, suppose. exactly. But that exactly. is, yeah, that is, that is a fab story. So you you. The closest you came to moving was right at the beginning of your career. Then absolutely, I mean, very, I mean it sounds yeah. like you would. It didn't right it, there. It just didn't quite yeah. happen. Yeah, I mean, it was kind of, you know, if my my first wife had, had she been keen to go and 
moved yeah. to London, and it, the know. move would have happened without question. Yeah. Wow. It's funny that like, there's little things that could change the trajectory of sliding doors. Yeah, sliding exactly, doors. exactly. So, um, so obviously, you know, you, you stayed at, at Southampton. It sounds like you're very happy that you did, and mm-hmm. you know, turned down big offers. I imagine <laughs> more money as well at the time. Actually, the the funny enough, the Spurs one. Um, in the kind of late eighties, early nineties, the the money disparity wasn't actually that big. Okay. So I think I ended up signing a new contract at Southampton when I when I turned Spurs down, um, and the money thing was almost comparable. Right. There wasn't a lot of difference in okay. it at all. Yeah. Um, it would have been different with the Chelsea one a few years later because Chelsea yep. were then just starting to to spend a few more. But even at that point, I was probably on about in the mid nineties. I was probably on about I don't know. Seventeen hundred, two grand a week. Right. Okay. Um, and at that point, if I'd have gone to Chelsea, I might have been on, I don't know, ten between ten and fifteen grand a week. Right. So you know, it, even though it's a huge amount of money, yeah, it's not quite the the disparity you see in the wages today. Where you know, if I was at Southampton now, I might be on I don't know, fifty, sixty grand a week. And if Man City come in for you and go, yeah. here's 200 grand a week, that's a lot of money. <laughs> that's, that's, that might even tempt my yeah. loyalty. <laughs> that is, uh, yeah, that is difficult to you say no I mean? to, isn't it? Yeah. That is, uh, and then obviously the, the chance to win trophies. But then I suppose you, to some extent, you had that same decision when you were making a decision. You were thinking that you were unlikely to win trophies if you stayed and more likely if you left. But that yeah, yeah. But that, that, it. I think for me, um, uh, there, there were a few things around it. So firstly, I was really always really grateful to Southampton for mm. giving me the chance to be a professional footballer first yeah. and foremost so um, you know I always felt like I owed them something for that mm. uh, secondly there was a obviously during the 90s a lot of the time we were kind of fighting relegation favourites for relegation most seasons yeah. um, and I felt like it was my responsibility that we didn't get relegated. Mm. Now, if I would have left at any point during that time and the following season, maybe Southampton got relegated, I don't think I would have been able to live with myself for that because I would have felt like that was my fault. I've deserted them. Yeah. And and they've got... Now, that sound, might sound a little bit arrogant. I just think no, it's no, only me that's keeping them up. Obviously, they could have gone out and got another player that might have done a better job than me, which which is fine. But that was just how I felt. Yeah. I felt a loyalty to, to the club that gave me a chance in football. And I didn't feel like I wanted to take that chance of leaving and then seeing them get relegated. Yeah. Yeah. That, uh, that I mean, that's admirable, I think, because I can't imagine many footballers would have a similar... No mindset and I wasn't in and as I said I, I was in football because I wanted to entertain yeah. people I, I wasn't and this sounds really odd to a lot of people but I wasn't in football primarily to win trophies mm. that yeah. wasn't that wasn't why I set out to be a professional footballer yeah uh, I set out to be a professional footballer because I knew I was good at it and I wanted to bring joy to people by letting them see me play football mm. um, and that that attitude, when I talk to people about that, I get some very funny looks from people who go, what? You wanted to be a footballer, but you didn't want to win a trophy. <laughs> of course I wanted to win a trophy, and I tried to win a trophy. Yeah. It just wasn't the be-all and end-all. Yeah. You know, and that that's like all things in life. It, not everything is black and white. There's, there's grey areas in there, and there's always a bit of nuance um, when it comes to things like that. And yes, I would have loved to have won a trophy with Southampton. Again, if I'd have, if I'd have left Southampton and gone to like the best team in the country and won the Premier League, would I have, would I have felt anywhere near as much pride in doing that than had I have stayed at Southampton and we'd have maybe got to a cup final and won a cup final? Because mm. I knew we were probably going to win the league. But I knew we always had a chance of winning the cup final. You know, yeah. everyone's got a chance yeah. to win the yeah. FA Cup in the Premier League. Um, and so, you know, that was a, another uh, another thing that I would have felt more pride in if I did win a trophy at Southampton. It would have meant so much more to that city and that club and those supporters than it would have done if I'd have gone to Man United and picked up yet another Premier League title. Yeah. I wonder if, you know, going back to the Jack Grealish example, I wonder... You know, I, I don't know him, and, and, and not sure. I'm sure he wouldn't volunteer any information along these lines, right? <laughs> but I wonder how he feels. He made. He went from his mm. his club. Yeah. He left. He won a treble, so he, he did 
incredibly well. And he was a big part of the team that season. Yeah. But is he having as much fun? Would he would he be more excited about the journey that Villa are going on right now? Like I do wonder about that. Like, yeah, yeah, it's an interesting one actually. Um you know, I think if I ever got the chance to meet Jack, I think that's probably one of the first questions I'd ask him. Yeah. Is he is he enjoying his football yeah. individually yeah. more now or was he enjoying it more when he was at uh, his club and playing football the way that he wanted to play. And he, and he probably could have been an example had he stayed at Villa of someone who would have been very similar to you, would have stayed at that club and done what he could with them and, and become like, you know, Mr. Aston Villa, as it were. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> as it were. Yeah. Um, it's interesting because it, everything kind of depends on how the individual sees things and how they see themselves and how they how they what what legacy they want to leave mm. when they when they go from football yeah. um and if you're if you if your legacy wants to be oh look what i want in my career mm -hmm. then all well and good you go for it um but you know the legacy that i wanted to leave was i wanted people to still be talking about the way that i played football in like 50 years time mm. you know yeah. and um, so far, a, so good. <laughs> to a certain degree, you know, it's been twenty years. And yeah, still exactly. Goals yeah, on, <laughs> yeah. On the sky, and absolutely. You know, little it's little things like you know, in two thousand eleven, um, the Southampton fans voted for the for their favourite ever player in the history of the football club, um, and I won that. I won that vote, so I was voted the the best player to play for Southampton in one hundred and twenty five years of their history. Yeah. Now that's. People, people go, well, that's not really a trophy, is it? It's not a trophy. But how many players can say that? Yeah, it means many, a lot. How many players can say that about the football club that they played for? Mm. That they were the best, voted the best player by the fans, the best player that's ever played for that football club. Mm. You know, that's, I find that, you know, that, that's something that makes me really proud. And there ain't too many people that can say that. Yeah, absolutely. And you've left that... I think that, you know, you've got that somewhat unique legacy because mm. of that, because you did stay and because you did do what you did and, and stayed there. And, uh, and um, I, th I imagine that the decisions you made, we just talked about a, a player that could have done a similar thing, but didn't. Do you think there's likely to be more players like that in the future? Like what you did, they choose to stay or do you think just the nature of it, they're going to go? I think the nature of, it, nature of football these days probably means they'll, yeah. they'll go. I think the, the rewards are, are almost too much to turn down, mm -hmm. um, you know. So I, I, I'd be surprised if you've got somebody, um, you know, in the in who's in a team fighting relegation season after season, who was putting up the goal scoring numbers that I was putting up. Um, I'd be very surprised if they stayed at that football club. Yeah, very very surprised. Yeah, um, and even I suppose if they're. They might stay there whilst they're there, like whilst the club is doing well. But if there's, I mean, using Southampton as an example, like a James Ward Prowse, for example, um, left when when the club was relegated, which no one can blame him for doing. No, absolutely decision. not. You know, absolutely he's not. He's a very talented player. Himself. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I, I, I mean, I was often asked that question. You know, had Southampton been relegated? Yeah. We kind of, we went. I think we went into four last day of the seasons in the nineties where we could have got wow. relegated. Um, but each time we didn't, and I kept getting asked the question, if you do go down, what would you do? Well, obviously you don't know what you would do until that situation arises. Yeah, I would like to think, and I said this a, a, a lot of the time, I'd like to think that if I if I had have got relegated for Southampton, the way that my mind worked and what I spoke about before, I would like to think that I would have given at least one season mm. in the championship to try and get us back, because I yeah. would have felt, I would have felt responsible for the fact that we got relegated okay. and I felt like I would have owed it to the club to at least give them a season to see if I could get them back in the Premier League. Yeah. Um, now, obviously, you don't know if, if it had happened and you know somebody came in for you and offered you whatever and the, and the football club might have then gone, we can't really afford to keep you in that league. We're going to have to sell you. Then, obviously, your decision's pretty much made for you. Yeah, and then you're not... You're sort of doing it in the club's interest at that point, so yeah, that loyalty that you feel towards the club is still very much intact if you make make the decision after at that point. Yeah, and I think that was that's why I think James Ward Prowse is is still you know the the fans at Southampton don't begrudge him getting the move at all. Yeah. Uh, you know the way that it came about, um, and I think his his legacy at the club wouldn't be tarnished. 
because he decided to go and join West Ham after you know we got relegated. You know, Absolutely he's, not. He's very talented player. Himself. Exactly. Yeah. 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 I, I. I mean, I was often asked that question. You know, had Southampton been relegated? And yeah. Kind of. We went. I think we went into four last day of the seasons in the nineties where we could have got wow. relegated. Um, but each time we did, and I kept getting asked the question: If you do go down, what would you do? Well, obviously, you don't know what you would do until that situation arises. Yeah. I would like to think, and I said this a, a, a lot of the time. I'd like to think that if I, if I had have got relegated for Southampton, the way that my mind worked and what I spoke about before, I would like to think that I would have given at least one season mm. in the Championship to try and get us back because I yeah. would have felt. I would have felt responsible for the fact that we got relegated okay. and I felt like I would have owed it to the club to at least give them a season to see if I could get them back in the Premier League. Yeah. Um, now, obviously, you don't know if, if it had happened and you know somebody came in for you and offered you whatever and the, and the football club might have then gone, we can't really afford to keep you in that league. We're going to have to sell you. Then, obviously, your decision's pretty much made for you. Yeah, and then you're not... You're sort of doing it in the club's interest at that point. So yeah. that loyalty that you feel towards the club is still very much intact if you make, make the decision after at that point. Yeah, and I think that was that's why I think James Ward Prowse is is still, you know, the the fans at Southampton don't begrudge him getting the move at all. Yeah. Uh, you know, the way that it came about. Um and I think his his legacy at the club wouldn't be tarnished because he decided to go and join West Ham after, you know, we got relegated. Just quickly on him, should he be in the England squad, do you think? I, I think he's been uh, a little bit unlucky down the years. Mm. Uh, I think there were times at Southampton where he was playing really, really well and not getting in the squad. Um, and I think there are things that he could do uh, on a pitch that were m- maybe missing a little bit from from the England squad. Uh, I'm not saying that he should have been in the team as, mm. as first pick every week. Yep. Um, but what I'm saying is he had abilities that nobody else in that squad really had and he could be he would be a really useful addition to have sat on the bench in a really tight game um, and you needed something to somebody to unlock something late on in the game you know you get a free kick around the box there's nobody better than him yeah you know his delivery from set pieces really gives you a good opportunity to to score goals um, and I think he would have been really useful. So I've been surprised when he's been left out of, of major squads at tournaments. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you could always have a a last minute, you know, a last minute plan B of quick get the ball to Grealish. He's going to win a foul. He'll, he'll win a foul. James Will Prowse is going to yeah. whip it in the top corner. Yeah. <laughs> it's not rocket science. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, if you stayed at Southampton, what was your life like? being that well-known and that famous? Were you able to go about and live life? Were you constantly mobbed? What was that? Uh, like? No, no, not constantly mobbed uh, at all. Uh, and I think that one of the reasons for that is that I always I always just carried on living my life like a normal person. Mm. I, didn't, I didn't hide myself away. Yeah. I would always um, be out and about in town. You know, I'd go shopping into Southampton. Uh, I'd eat in restaurants in town the whole time. Um, there were there were times when you know people would stop you for a picture or an autograph or whatever, um, but it was never to a level where it was getting on my nerves mm-hmm. or I, nothing that I couldn't couldn't cope with. Yeah, um, and so yeah, I've, I've kind of, and, and I think maybe that was a, another reason. I never really, growing up, I never had an ambition to be really famous. Mm. That wasn't. I never. I never wanted that. I wanted to be a footballer, and I and I knew with that would come a little bit of uh, of that kind of thing but I, I never really wanted to be somebody who was kind of elevated to a level where it would be uncomfortable to live your life normally so I, I've always kind of gone about my business um, you know people would see me you know I used to take my mother-in-law to uh, bingo hall in Southampton you know <laughs> you would see me at the weirdest places because nice. I just I just I just a normal bloke. I was just a little kid from Guernsey who just happened to be good at football. Yeah. And I just carried on living my life as any other person would do. And I'd go places where everyone else went. You know, I'd, I'd go to concerts and I wouldn't be in the VIP seats. I'd be mm. sat in normal <laughs> seats and, or stood up and people turn around like, oh, I, you know, <laughs> yeah. do a double take all yeah. the time. And uh, <laughs> but but actually sometimes um, actually being 
being famous isn't all it's cracked up to be. Yeah. Uh, because there are some times where it, you just get put in some positions where it's you kind of it's a little bit awkward. Now I had one, I had one uh, just after I retired, it, and this is in a pub in Southampton, mm. and uh, so I, I was taking a young lady out for lunch. This was between my two marriages, and I was taking a young lady on a first date out for lunch, <laughs> and we went to this pub in Southampton. I walked up to the bar, ordered a couple of drinks, and the barman started looking at me a bit funny. <laughs> and uh, so I just stood there and I thought, oh, here we go. Yeah. And uh, he came back with the drinks and he went, I recognise you from somewhere. <laughs> right? And I thought, I've just played football in your city for the last 16 years, man, do you know what I mean? <laughs> but you can't say anything in those situations. So I just stood there and I went, all right. <laughs> and he went, he went, yeah, yeah, he said, don't tell me, don't tell me. So I, so I did, I paid him for my drinks. And as he'd come back with my chains, the pennies finally dropped. And he's come back, he's gone, I've got it. He said, you're a sportsman, weren't you? And I went, yeah, kind of. He said, uh, you played for England, didn't you? And I looked at the young lady. I went, yeah, I did. <laughs> and he went, I knew it. He said, Phil Tufnell. <laughs> Seriously. Brilliant. Of all places. <laughs> it, I, mean, I never thought in Southampton, in a pub in Southampton, that I would yeah. get mistaken for anyone else. But it happened. There we go. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. Just set you up perfectly on, oh, your, uh, on, your, on, on your first date. <laughs> that's that's uh <laughs> that's brilliant yeah. um and what's that like now you know in terms of being recognized you, know, you live in the area still like when you're out about in southampton is it yeah, died people, down people, similar all nice and friendly yeah because it never really it was never really mad yeah um you know and the the southampton people are actually quite reserved you okay. know it, it probably different i was playing for newcastle or right you know Got somebody you. was a yeah real, yeah so the, the Southampton folk are a bit more reserved. So they kind of tend to leave you alone a little bit. They'll they'll wait till you've walked past before they nudge their mate and go, oh, look, it's Matt and Tissy. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. And, yeah, and yeah. most of the time, I, I just, <laughs> because I'm so oblivious to it all, I'm just going about my life normally. I don't notice it half the time. And, yeah. and a lot of the time, the people that were with me, they go, did you not see that? <laughs> did you not Did you not hear that bloke? I was like, what? And, then, and it's like, I just, I don't know. And it's the same now, it's, People don't kind of come up to you every every minute. I can walk mm. around West Key Shopping Centre in Southampton, the middle yeah. of Southampton, and I might get stopped once or twice in a couple of hours. Right. Okay. It's it's like that. It's, yeah. It's just not they're not intrusive in any way. So it sounds like you've got quite a lot of the benefits associated with the the notoriety that you got from from playing without it being too far and, and being the negatives. No, absolutely. Absolutely. Nice. So yeah, I've, I've, I've been very lucky in my life. I've been able to have a nice life. You know, uh, yeah. I've always earned a nice amount of money to, to give me. And I've never really been one for big flash cars and, mm. you know, spending tens of thousands of pounds on holidays. That's, that's never been, that's never been me. So I've never had to have um, a massive wage to fund a, a lavish lifestyle. That's, yeah, it's just not not the way I am, um, uh, and so being in Southampton has been perfect for me. Really, sounds ideal. Great. So after you retired as a as a footballer, you worked for Sky for oh, I did many years, about fifteen years, I believe. It was fifteen years under contract, and, and a two or three years uh, being a non contract, where I was just kind of paid every time I turned up. Yeah. Um, yeah. So on Soccer Saturday, that was that was good fun. Is that something you had thought about when you were still playing that you might want to get involved in the media or anything like that? It's just uh, no, something that came up. I didn't. Uh, I didn't have any idea what I was going to do. When I <laughs> okay. To the even on the the day that I retired, I didn't have a clue. I was I was quite lucky. I had a, uh, a testimonial at Southampton, my last ever game there. Mm -hmm. It was a full house down at St Mary, so I had a nice cushion there, which meant I didn't have to go out and look for work straight away. Yeah. So I kind of spent a couple of years just. Uh, playing lots of golf and um, uh, and then you know things would would be put in front of me and say do you fancy doing this and and actually it was actually a couple of months before I retired that the that soccer Saturday actually phoned me up and said uh, would you do a midweek soccer special for us so it was mm. a Tuesday night game I think and I'd seen the show and I thought oh, it was quite quite good fun so I thought yeah I'll give that a go so I went on and did one um, uh, and then obviously they they kind of knew that I'd retired and then they would ring me, you know, every now and then and just say, oh, you know, George Best can't make this week or Rodney Marsh can't make this week. Would you sit in? So I was like, yeah, that's fine. So I didn't really have any massive ambitions to, mm. to want to do that as a career. Um, I just enjoyed it. So I kind of did it. And that's kind of how my life's progressed, really. I kind of don't really have a lot of plans. Um, you know, I just go with the flow, see what see what comes up and 
live my life accordingly. Um, and then kind of a couple of years later, Rodney Marsh got sacked, um, which <laughs> ironically, he was sacked for making an inappropriate joke on television okay. that, that got him cancelled. Yeah. And, uh, and that's when they came to me and said, oh, you know, can you do every every Saturday until the end of the season. This was in January, I think it was, the end of January. Mm -hmm. They said, can you do every Saturday to the end of the season? So I was like, yeah, all right, that's fine. So I did that and then um, all went well. And then the following season, a um, couple of weeks before the season started, I think it was two or three weeks before the season started, the producer texted me and said, oh, we, we'd like to give you a contract, uh, a year's contract. Okay. So I was like, mm. <laughs> Because I was doing other work for you know BBC and ITV, it would have meant yeah. that I was you know just just become I'd have to get rid of all that other stuff and mm -hmm. just do Sky. So uh, so I texted him back and I remember I remember going um, actually I said one year's not really here nor there. I said um, I said if you make it two years I'll do, I'll do it. You know it gives me a little bit of yeah security. So I said if, if you make it two years I'll sign it. Mm. And. Uh, after I sent them the text, I never heard back from him for about a month. <laughs> and I was like, oh, no. I thought, I thought you might have overplayed your hand. hand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then after about a month, he came back and went, yeah, all right, we'll give you two years. Okay. Um, and, and that was it. And that's kind of where it all started. And then every two years, I just go, oh, it's another two years, it's another two years. Um, until uh, 2020. Yeah, <laughs> when everything changed. Yes, so yeah. So I wanted to ask about that. So obviously, you said it was fun. Sounds like you enjoyed it. I loved it. It was great fun. But it didn't end how you wanted it to end. It, it, it was a little bit disappointing in the way that it all ended. I knew, obviously, at some point, you know, everybody has a shelf life, right? Um, okay. You know, I'd had 15, 15 years doing that every week. It was, it yeah. was, as I say, great fun. Great bunch of lads. You know, we got yeah. on, got on brilliantly with Jeff and Merce and Tomo and Charlie. Um, really nice chemistry between us on the telly, and it was brilliant. Um, but yeah, I think I think we all knew at some stage it would come to an end. Um, but yeah, it was a, it was a little bit disappointing at the way that it did end. Given that I'd you know fifteen years mm -hmm. under contract, two or three years before that, um, and it basically all ended with about a four minute Zoom call, which I had no warning of. Um, the only warning I had, so I was told before the 2020 season started, um, I was asked to this Zoom meeting on the pretext that needed to talk about the upcoming season. Um, and so I was given this Zoom call, uh, this link to, to join. Um, and I noticed when I was given the link, there was another name that was attached onto it because I thought it was just going to be me and the head of football at Sky. Mm. There was this other guy, this, this name I'd never recognised. So when I clicked on the Zoom link and I saw this guy there and uh, Gary introduced this guy as... Uh, HR witness HR. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're I in trouble. Like, as soon as he did that, I went, oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> and he literally went, uh, sorry, Matt. He said, um, uh, there's no more work for you here at Sky, so uh, we're going to terminate your contract. So I had about seven months left of my contract. So I was like, Okay. Right. Um, this is like a week before the season started, so I have no chance to get yeah. any other work for for that season. Everyone's got their pundits sorted out, so which I thought was a bit was a bit off, mm -hmm. um, yeah. a little bit unfair. Yeah. Um, and then this was the other thing. I mean, under the terms of my contract, uh, I, they were due to pay me three months wages. Yep. So he said, and to "Be fair." He went. <laughs> He went, we, we are due to pay you three months wages, he said, but given that it's a week before the season, he said, well, we're going to give you six months. Okay. So I was like, oh, fair enough. But I had seven months left on my contract. Yeah. So I was like, wow, come on. <laughs> I've just worked for you for 18 years. Why don't you just pay up? Why don't you just give me the seven months? You know, Round it up. I mean, geez, so, uh, so in the end, I was like, so then I said to him, I said, right, I said, uh, I said, okay, fair enough. I said, can I just ask you a question? I said, has this got anything to do with what I've been posting on social media? Because mm. obviously I, I've been quite controversial in my views, apparently, which I thought were quite centrist. But, um, and he turned around and he went, um, he said, well, he said, we do have to take into account the reputation of our company when it comes to that kind of stuff. 
So that for me was like, yes, basically. Yeah. Uh, and so I just turned around and I went, well, I said, it's interesting. I said, because you didn't seem too bothered about the reputation of your company when you re-employed Jamie Carragher after he spat a young girl out of his car. And it, <laughs> I see him just go, and, <laughs> and, and, it, and he went, well, we can't talk about other people really. And, uh, and that's, how it, that's how it all ended. It was quite sad really after 18 years, you know, it was just I just thought it was a disappointing way to handle it. So what? So actually, what I did in the end was, um, he uh, obviously sent a contract out to I had to sign something to non disclosure yep. agreement, all that nonsense, <laughs> and um, and so what I ended up doing is I, I waited till just after the next payday, okay, and then I signed it and sent it back to them. So I actually ended up getting my seven months because I waited for one perfect. More so well done. If you're gonna if you're Absolutely. gonna be, if you're gonna play silly buggers, I'm gonna do the same. Absolutely. So I ended up getting the seven months in the end. But you know, it's just it was just petty, and I thought it was just a sad way to end. You yeah. know, after I'd, I'd had a fantastic period of time working for them, I thought it could have been done a little bit better. Yeah, absolutely. Sounds that way. It seems a very strange world where someone can get in more trouble for saying something than for spitting. Doing something. Yeah. Of public. That seems <laughs> very yeah. bizarre to me. It, it, it is bizarre. Um, but I think, uh, you know, it, it is what it is. I've... I, I've not. I'm not bitter about it in, mm. in any way, shape, or form. I was disappointed the way they finished it. I knew at some point my time would come to an end, and that's fine. I, had, as I said, 18 years altogether in the end, uh, working for them. Um, that's a pretty good stint. Yeah, I'm, I'm lucky to have been able to have lasted that long. Um, and you know, life moves on, and you go on to do different things. And that's what my path was meant to be. And I just crack on and get on with it. It seems, yeah, it seems to have worked well for you so far, as you say, to be a person that goes with the flow and, and treats things that way. Um, will there be any part of you that might be um, a little bit a little bit happy, perhaps, if Jamie Carragher meets a, meets an end? Is there any ill will there, thinking <laughs> thinking this is unjust, this is unfair, and if he goes for something slightly controversial that he didn't maybe perhaps shouldn't have said, <laughs> be a little little bit of joy there. Uh. <laughs> Not really. I don't really care about Jamie Garrigan, <laughs> okay. to be honest. He cares, okay. he cares more about me. That, that, I think the fact that um, uh, the fact that he gets more upset about things that I say right. uh, gives me a, a nice inner glow because uh, I know that he'll, he'll be upset when he hears that story again uh, yes. because he rang me last summer, actually, because I spoke about it for the first time in a podcast last year. And uh, he'd obviously heard it and wasn't very happy uh, and I, I was I was in London uh, last summer with my parents and uh, my family my, all my brothers and we were out shopping and, uh, and I got a phone call a number I didn't recognise <laughs> yeah. and uh, so I picked up and went hello he went cheers it's Cara <laughs> and I was like alright mate how you doing he's like I'm not happy I was like what do you mean <laughs> He went, you know, I'm not happy with you. He said, I heard that podcast, you talking about me spitting at the girl. Um, I went, all right. So what was the problem? He went, you shouldn't be talking about that. I was like, it happened, didn't it? He went, yeah. He said, but he, he said you're stirring it all up and it's, it's not good for my family. And I went, but it did happen, didn't it? I said, you did do it. He went, yeah. He said, but, but he said, you shouldn't be bringing that up. I went, Jamie, I said, it's not my fault that you spat at a girl. It happened. And if I want to talk about it, I'm well within my rights to talk about it. If it didn't happen and you're telling me that it, didn't, it never happened, that's fine. But it happened. I said, so it's not really my fault that your family are upset, is it? At <laughs> some point, you have to take responsibility for your actions. And it's actually you that's upsetting your family by your actions. Well, no, no, I'm not. I'm not happy about you doing that. She's, and he, honestly, he was ranting at me and swearing at me down the phone for about ten minutes. And I'm just walking along the street in London, just like that. And, uh, and then my wife joined me. She came out of the shop, and she's and I'm walking along the street. And I was like, just, I was very calm about everything. And he was, he was ranting at me, going, "I'm going to be bang on your social media. Anything you say, I'm going to jump all over you, and all this stuff." And I was like, Jamie, said I'm fifty odd years of age, mate. <laughs> I said, I don't really care if you jump on a social media post. I don't live in that world. I know that that world is not actually real life. 
I said, real life is what happens in every day with your family and all that stuff. I said, so don't worry about it. I said, I'm good. I said, I'm fine. I said, but you did that. You need to take responsibility for it. So, so anyway, the phone call ended and my missus went, who was that? <laughs> and I went, oh, it's Jamie Carragher. He's a bit upset. So he just spent 10 minutes ranting at me because I brought up him spitting at a girl out of his car. <laughs> and, uh, and she went, you're so annoying. <laughs> and I went, I went, me? She went, yeah. I said, he's trying to have an argument with you. He said, and you don't do it. You don't rise to the bait. She said, you right. just stay calm. She said, it's really annoying when you do that. <laughs> and I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> he, he wanted to really get into it with you. Yeah, he wanted, me to, like, lose, he wanted me to lose you were my just, shit. Yeah, you were just he staying probably, level. He was probably recording the conversation. Oh, okay. Oh, interesting. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I don't know for sure. I'm guessing he might have been looking for a reaction from me. Okay. So that he could... Yeah, could potentially use. That. I actually now wish I'd have recorded the conversation. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It sounds because he wouldn't have come across very well. Yeah, but definitely I'm, not. But that's not something that I would, I would even think to do. It's not no. on my radar. I don't. But I mean, as you say, it's in, you have done it. We've all seen the video. <laughs> you know, it's all out there, and we've seen it. And already denied that, can you? No, and um, unless it was AI generated, <laughs> <laughs> I think it was. I think it was a few years too early for him to be able to claim that one. We may well see people doing things like that in the future, might we? The court doing something they shouldn't be like. It's not me. It's yeah, you know. It's AI. It's it's the tech. Yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's done that. So um, so yeah, that was interesting. Yes. Yeah. So wow. would I would I have an would I have a, a sneaky smile if he got sacked for saying something controversial? Not really. I think I'll be the better man, bigger man, and, and you know, everyone has to live their own life the way that they want to live it. Mm -hmm. You take the consequences that go with it. I've had to take the consequences of my actions over the last few years, and I've done that, taken on the chin, moved on, and I sit here today very relaxed and with no regrets about anything that I've done. Um, I might have made mistakes, and I, if I have made a mistake, I'd apologise for it, um, you know, because I think that's what you should do in life. Um, I sit here with a pretty clear conscience, quite frankly. Wow, wow. Yeah, well done. I think if someone had phoned me up and was having a right go, I, I, I might well them just wish them just a little bit of uh, <laughs> <laughs> of misfortune. But um, there no, we go. I don't, I don't carry bitterness. I don't carry regret. <laughs> I don't carry jealousy. So on that topic, you wouldn't change anything about. You mentioned that. They didn't say it as much, but you're pretty sure that the reason why Sky decided to end things was because of what you've been putting about on social media. You wouldn't change anything you'd said at the time. No, I, as I said, I, I don't have any regrets. I, if I've made a mistake, and, and there were a couple of times where I kind of posted something which um, was probably not appropriate for the point I was trying to make. Okay. I used the wrong example yep. for the point I was trying to make. So when I did that, I then, uh, I then went back and I deleted and I apologised for that. Uh, and I moved on because I think that's the right thing to do. Mm. Um, everything else, I don't have any regrets because, um, you know, I don't think I did anything wrong. Yeah. Um, you know, I was, uh, felt like I was in a position to be able to say something um, when I saw something that wasn't right. Um, uh, and I think morally it was the right thing to do. And I think there are people who know that there's a lot of things that aren't right in the world at the moment, but will not say anything uh, because they're frightened that they'll lose their job. Mm. You know, and the fact that that is even a thing <clears throat> should tell you that something isn't right in this world yeah. when you are frightened to give an opinion on something because you're going to get cancelled. The fact that we have that alone should be enough for people to go, I don't want to live in this world. I don't mm. want to live in a world that, that where you are f so scared to say something that you might get cancelled and get sacked from your job. It It's not right. And that is a world that I thought was in a country like China mm. or North Korea. Mm -hmm. um, and I never thought that I would feel like that in this country. Yeah, and... We, you know, I said my background is in marketing. We work, we've worked with a lot of big brands. And one of the things that you often see is that people will say things like they might say to us, oh, we can't include that. We can't do this. The person telling you that doesn't necessarily agree with that policy. Mm -hmm. So you may well have found that the people telling you that, sorry, there's no work for you here anymore. They may even completely agree with what you were saying on social yep. media. But it's almost like everyone is afraid of, it's like, but 
at some point, surely there has to be someone that you're actually afraid of somewhere making decisions. It almost seems like everyone's trying to preempt stuff and they're worried about potential backlash on social media. And <laughs> yeah. Um, and it is, is very strange. It seems that anyone who does share any opinions like yourself that might differ from the mainstream narrative, they just get labeled as a conspiracy theorist. Yeah. And then the idea is, okay, they're just shut down now. And yeah, yeah, that's how that's, it's, it's a very clever way of doing things. And it's something that's been worked on for a, for a long time mm. uh, in terms of um, how you shut down a debate, how you don't want to have a conversation with somebody. Is you just, you just go conspiracy theorist, misogynist, racist, anti-Semite. Yeah. You just use all these terms and go, right, I've used that word now. I don't have to debate with them anymore because I've taken the moral high ground. I've called him a name and uh, now everyone's going to think he's that. Yeah. And it's just a really childish uh, way of uh, actually shutting down debate. And it's, it, it's something that everybody should be concerned about because without, without free speech, um, you have, uh, there's a real opportunity for a tyrannical government to take over uh, and I think we are at the beginnings of that and uh, it needs to be nipped in the bud and that's why that's why I decided to speak out that's a, a very scary prospect and you're certainly not the only one worried about that I mean that was one of the big reasons why Elon Musk bought Twitter now you know renamed it as X as he was given those as a reason he said look if we don't have free speech yep. he's been working on projects that are designed to make us interplanetary and sustainable energy and he says none of that matters if the political situation, the public discourse goes so um, off to one side that we end up with a situation like what you described. Yeah, I, and I think, I think actually, you know, the pendulum has swung so far, um, you know, in, in one direction mm. that I think it's only a matter of time before people actually start standing up. And we're starting to see it a little bit in the last kind of year or so that people are starting to fight back against it. Um, and you know you're getting brands being boycotted because of certain yeah. views that they've taken yeah. um, and that is that I think will happen more and more because more and more people are starting to go hang on a minute this is this is swung way too far we all want equality and diversity we want everything to be equal <clears throat> but you you swing the pendulum too far that way um, you you go too far that way you're just as bad as the people where you started over here. Mm -hmm. You know, there's got to be a, a point in the middle where there's got to be some kind of equity for everybody um, yeah. and not just for certain groups. Um, and I think we're seeing people start to push back against that now. Mm. So it, you find it encouraging what we've seen, <laughs> as you say, with the boycotts. I saw some numbers recently saying that Disney attendance is way down and obviously the Bud Light situation is, yep. is well publicised. That that give you some encouragement? Do you feel a it bit does. more positive seeing these yeah, things happen? Yeah, I, I think it. I think it does. Um, you know, I think there are there are times when uh, people are going to say enough is enough, mm -hmm. um, uh, and I think that's definitely happened. Uh, I mean, I'm not. I don't really. Sh I don't think we should ever be in a place where we should boycott things. Okay. Um, but if you get pushed too far, that's the consequence of it. Okay. I prefer the pushback to have started a lot earlier yeah. uh, and not have to kind of resort to those boycotting measures. You know, if, if we had a world where, where it was fairness and, and, you know, we kind of sat in the middle and give people choices and let people make their own minds up, I think that's the best place you can be in the world. If you go too far that way and go, no, no, you can't do that, you can't do that, you can't do that, keep people... If people keep getting told you can't do that, you can't do that, eventually they're going to go, no, I've mm. had enough now. Mm. You get your ass out there and I'm going to do. And they'll end up, by going too far that way, you'll end up kicking back and you'll end up going too far that way again. Yeah. And if we can find this place in the middle where we can all kind of get on and, and have open debate and, and come and almost... What I'd actually like to see is actually in our country, I prefer some kind of direct democracy rather than the system that we've got at the moment. Okay. Um, you know, I think in this day and age with the technology that is available to us, I don't think we need massive governments. Mm. I, I really don't. I, I feel like government should be a lot smaller and with the technology available that everybody's got at the press of a button that we can have votes on things. 
um, you know, and there's a there's a way that that can be done, which can't be corrupted, then, you know, I, I think that's the way forward. I think we should be able to have, get rid of the, the party system, if you like, where MPs are not really in Parliament, you know, for their constituents. Yeah. They're basically there to toe the party line. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. uh, and I think that system is now so antiquated. I think it's coming to a, a point where we, we need to get rid of that system uh, and have a form of direct democracy where you can just vote on a issue without it being a party political issue where, you know, the red party vote for this and the blue party yeah. vote for that. Well, hang on, let's take parties out of it and let's just let each individual decide what they feel is best for the country going forward. And that way, that's proper democracy. And then you'll get more than 50% vote for it. Then it comes in. Yeah, which, as you say, surely the technology is there to implement something like that. Oh, it's 100% there. I mean, we, we trust we trust technology with our finances. We trust it with online banking. And like, So most people would probably feel they want their money more secure than their vote. Probably, not all. But <laughs> if you do, if you do trust all your life savings, let's say... To a piece of technology, you probably can get to a place where you'd feel comfortable having a political say on, on something. I would have thought so. I do think it's interesting you mentioned on the boycotts because I I always naturally feel a little bit uncomfortable when anything political is used in a marketing sense one way or the other. Sometimes we work yeah. with brands and they say, oh, we lean politically this way and we found that helps us generate more sales. And I almost feel like that should be something separate. I mean, obviously in those examples with the boycotts, it's kind of worked in the opposite where they've yeah. demonstrated political leanings that have then led people going, okay, well, I'm not interested now. Yeah. Um, but even going the other way, using it as a tool to generate sales and help shift product to service, I almost feel like just naturally feels a little bit it, icky. Like yeah. It should not, be something separate. Yeah, absolutely. It should be something separate. Yeah. Quite yeah. agree with you. Yeah. Okay. Um, so since you've left Sky, yep. had a bit more time on your hands, what are you uh, keeping yourself busy with now and uh, uh, I play a lot of golf <laughs> nice <laughs> um, so yeah I've had a, a little bit more time we've been able to play on Saturday afternoon sometimes now which is interesting Lovely. <laughs> I think the first it was really odd the first Saturday like when I at the week after I'd been sacked I think it was the first the first day of the season and uh, Saturday morning came and I was like oh, I'm not working today it's like <sighs> my daughter and my wife had gone off somewhere I was like Oh. <laughs> just have a look, see if there's any tea times. And it was really, it was really weird. So the only tea time that I could get on that Saturday afternoon was three o'clock. There you go. And I was like, oh, <laughs> isn't that funny? If I must. Um, so there I was, three o'clock uh, on the Saturday afternoon when uh, I should have been watching some Premier League football match. I was there on the first tee at Stone and Golf Club. Okay. Um, so yeah, that was that's fun. So yeah, I play lots of golf. Um, nice. Uh, I do after dinner speaking. Mm. Um, so I really enjoy that. Uh, that and you've got the good stories to be able to tell. <laughs> I've, I've got some nice stories to be able to tell, and uh, and yeah, I like making people laugh. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a nice skill to have, and most of the time people laugh in all the right places, which is good. Um, so yeah, I do I do that. Uh, I've become an affiliate for a CBD company, Supreme mm. CBD. Um, so I, I started using those products earlier on this year. Um, uh, and I felt like I've never really used my social media platform to kind of promote things for, for money. Um, and so when I was approached by this company, I was like, yeah, I'm not really comfortable with that. Um, you know, this is it's not what, what I'm doing my social media for. So I wasn't going to just go out and, and promote it. So um, I, I'd actually said no to him to Anthony, Anthony Fowler about a year ago or over a year ago. Mm. And then kind of, he was quite persistent. He came back and, mm. and I said, well, I said, just send me some of the stuff to try. Mm. I said, because I, I wouldn't ever, you know, be promoting stuff on there that I didn't know worked. And uh, and so he sent me some some oil and some gummies and, and I started using the gummies. My wife started using the oil. She has um, osteoarthritis in her fingers. Okay. Uh, and, and, the pair of us actually really, really noticed a, a big difference. She had um, noticed a massive difference in the pain that she was suffering in her osteoarthritis. Um, and, and I started noticing that, you know, I was, I was sleeping a lot better when I was taking these gummies just before I was going to bed. Um, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't getting up in the middle of the night for a wee every, every <laughs> night like I used to. And, um, and I was just feeling, waking up feeling so much more refreshed every day. So I was like, 
okay, this is good. So when when I you know had my personal experience of it working, I was happy to go and uh, to go and become a, an affiliate with them. So I've been working with them a little bit, um, various appearances uh, here and there. You know, occasionally get asked to open things or you know, mm. come on podcasts. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, um, and yeah, so kind of. My, my life's pretty random, actually. I don't ever have one week that's the same yeah. as the next one. It's I kind of like it that way. Yeah. I, I like a bit of... Interesting. Like sounds a bit of like chaos. Like, as we spoke yeah, yeah, yeah. Get chaos. the ball in the box. What happens? <laughs> Go for it. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. You mentioned around... It's Supreme CBD is the, is the name, Supreme isn't it? Supreme CBD, yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, it's my wheelhouse. is social media advertising, marketing. And I think that a lot of people have an initial reaction like you did, like, oh, I'm not sure I want to do that. I think it completely depends what you're promoting at the end yeah, of the day. If absolutely. you promote something that you absolutely, absolutely. believe in, you yeah. think's good quality, like, shout it from the rooftops that's, if you think it's going to help exactly, people. That's exactly what I've done. Um, yeah. You know, as, as I said, I did feel a bit uncomfortable about it, but then when I realised, actually, this stuff works, and yeah. I did a bit of research into it uh, about, you know, how it, it helps the endocannabinoid system and all that, mm. uh, and it was fascinating. So that's why yeah, I was I was happy to do that, and happy to take the uh, the slings and arrows that come with it from the uh, from the bots and trolls who, who don't like the fact that it's got nothing to do with the pharmaceutical industry. Um, yeah. yeah, so it's uh, it, it's been good. It's inevitable. You said you've promoted those social media. Where are you primarily active? What uh, social channels do you uh, use? I, I used uh, Twitter now um, uh, at Matt Latis Seven. Um, that's kind of the my only really what well, I was using Getter for a while mm. um, uh, as well and, and conducted a lot of really fascinating interviews on there with people actually mm. kind of gave me a, a broader knowledge of everything that's gone on in the world in the last yeah. two or three years as well so that's that was uh, really eye-opening you know to be interviewing people like uh, Peter McCullough and Robert Malone and Mike Eden, uh, Majid Noirs, um, Ivor Cummins, people like that. It was just fonts of, of knowledge and um, I, I found it really fascinating to to sit and talk to them for a, an hour or so at a time and, yeah. um, and really gain knowledge off those guys as well. Cool. And But you're not no longer active on there anymore? Uh, I haven't been for the last few months, actually. I, I've kind of... I, I went back to, to fighting on Twitter, really. <laughs> I... I as tempting as it is, it's kind of a bit of a little bit of an echo chamberish uh, on getting it's much, yeah, more leaning towards the right, yeah, uh, you know, and I preferred uh, eventually to kind of <laughs> engage with people who perhaps didn't agree with me, yeah, uh, and you know, try to convince them that you know the government don't always tell you the truth, it's, uh, yeah, and uh, the the media don't always tell you the truth, and um, yeah, it's been it's been interesting. Yeah, it's uh, it, it's quite nice to receive people saying I agree with you and all that sort of stuff. But every now and then that gets a little bit boring. So yeah, sometimes and, you want a, a little scrap. <laughs> uh, yeah, and uh, and I think it's been fascinating for me actually to to see how the <coughs> replies have evolved over the last three years. Mm. You know, from very early on when I took the stance that you know we shouldn't be locking down because yeah. that's going to cause far more damage than um, than if we didn't. Um, uh, and I was getting, you know, probably ninety five percent of the replies mm. were uh, were pretty negative and abusive and uh, yeah. and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and to see it kind of evolve and change over the last three years has been has been really fascinating. To to that, I mean, I went through a time for a period of time where I was like, I was just putting my thoughts out there, and I wasn't even I wasn't even looking at the replies in the end because I was like, yeah, I mean, these people are just not very nice people really yeah, you know i just yeah. i don't mind somebody disagreeing with me yeah you yeah. could do it in a respectful way you know you don't have to throw abuse and yeah. swear words at people you know if you've got a different opinion that's that's absolutely fine i have no problem with that uh but you know put it across in a in a polite and civilized manner and we can have a conversation mm. you know it's not rocket science so uh, you mentioned around the the change in perspective that's happened over the last three years mm. you must feel somewhat vindicated in what you were saying back then that led to the issues with sky and that almost every day i seem to see more people changing their opinion and yeah. coming around to the fact of like you know now we see for example record high inflation and there's all sorts of issues that have come out of it is that is that more frustrating is that a bit satisfying to be like oh, i think i was right still it, it I don't find it satisfying in any way. I think what I find satisfying 
is uh, seeing people who were so entrenched in their views and, you know, going very much with the, the government narrative and believing everything they heard on the BBC. Mm. Um, I, I get encouraged by people who were in that position who are now big enough to change that view. Yeah. Um, because, you know, that that's quite a shift that they've got to take there. Um, and I think it, it shows an ability to to think critically as well, to not just be, that's my view and I'm never changing it. When the evidence comes out and you're able to then change your opinion, I find that encouraging when people now come up to me and, and will say, Matt, I thought you were a bit mad a couple of years ago. Yeah. But, uh, and that kind of gives me more uh, hope than anything else that, you know, there is something happening in the world at the moment where people are, you know, starting to look back and think, hang on a minute, maybe maybe we weren't being told the truth mm. a couple of years ago. Um, and I, I don't feel... I don't feel any great sense of pride in that. I, I've yeah. because I've I've only ever I've only ever said what I felt needed saying and felt like it was the right thing to do that I was saying. Yeah. Everything that I've done has come from from what I feel in my gut. Um and yeah, I think I think with time and that's why I said I don't really have any regrets is because um the more evidence that comes out the more it is in support of what I was saying two or three years ago. Now, yeah. if people aren't willing to acknowledge that, that I don't mind that. That's that's fine. That's that's mm. their that's their problem. If they're if they're willing to dismiss that, then you know I can't, I'm not going to change their minds. You know, um, so I don't lose sleep over that. Uh, but it has been encouraging when when I go out in public um, when people are and they are regularly coming up to me now and have done more so over the last 18 months um and shaking my hand and saying thank you very much for speaking out mm. because without people like you we thought we were going mad yeah yeah uh, because we thought the same as you but nobody in the media would say it um and so that's that's been really encouraging as well the last 18 months more and more people when i'm out in public will come and say those things to me and shake my hand I think there would be a lot more skepticism going forward from a lot of people if, if anything they tried like it again. Exactly. Yeah. Or I'd even like or even a lot so. of other topics as well. Yeah, yeah. Just a general skepticism of like I'm not just going to believe what's being told because it comes from this yeah. media source as people would have done previously. Yeah, no, I think I think there has definitely been a a massive shift in the in the amount of trust people have in in the mainstream media. Yeah. Uh, and you know, I think there's some uh, there's a lot of good journalists out there who aren't in the mainstream media that that do some good work and i think more and more people are kind of looking towards those guys for yeah. more truthful information and not you know the propaganda driven stuff that we're we're seeing on uh, on the government funded uh media channels that we get and they can see where their incentives may or may not lie mm. and you know the next big thing is, is obviously is the climate change nonsense mm. that's the that's the next big narrative that the media were going with um, and that we will get bombarded by that 24 hours a day, just like we were bombarded with the COVID 24 hours a day. And I'd hope that people can see the similarities in it, in the techniques that they're using to try and guilt trip you into mm. doing all this stuff. And uh, uh, and don't ever let them get you to eat insects. <laughs> <laughs> don't take away our steaks. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, so just coming back on to, uh, well, I suppose this is tied into the media, but coming back to uh, to football somewhat, where do you feel we're at in terms of football as a, a sport, as an industry? Is it in a good place? Is it heading in a bad direction? What are your thoughts on that? Um, I find, I found myself actually the last year or so having a little less interest okay. in football. Okay. Uh, and I think one of the things that, that's turning me off from it um, is the money side of things, if I'm honest. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it's <coughs> it's gotten to be a case of, you know, who, who's, who's got the biggest wallet and how can we how can we cheat the rules, the yeah. financial fair play rules? How can we cheat them to make us the best club? Um, so, yeah, a little bit of that, a little bit of the play acting um, mm. is kind of, 
turns me off a little bit. You know, you've got players barely getting touched and going down screaming and, you know, it's been going on for for a while, but it seems to have gone a little bit worse. Uh, so that's kind of something that I don't enjoy about the game. Um, so I'm I'm not sure it's in a it's in a brilliant place. I think it could be in a better place. I think VAR could be better. I think that's one of the things you keep it. You wouldn't improved. you wouldn't scrap it. Um, I'd I think I'd want to try to make it better first before deciding that yeah we got to scrap it. So there was two things that I think could improve it. Um, and one, in fact, both of them, I, I'm uh, pretty much saying s- even before it came in. So I remember having a debate on Sky about it when it was talked about being coming in. Uh, and I said this, I said, in that room, two things. I think there should be a former professional footballer in that mm-hmm. room. Mm-hmm. Not to make the decisions, but just to be there as a sounding board for the officials to go, oh, in that situation there... What do you think is what do you think has happened there? Do you think that's deliberate? Yeah. yeah. You know, because when you've played at that at that level, you've been in that situation, you've got a much more but much better idea of, of whether or not a player has intent. Mm. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, than people that haven't been in that situation. The referees that haven't played at that level and, and haven't seen what goes on all the sneaky things that go on that sometimes they don't see and, <laughs> and former players will see so that was the first thing that I said I think could be useful to them and the other thing was that I didn't I don't think and I didn't think that the people in the VAR room they shouldn't come from the same group of referees as the ones that are refereeing on the pitch okay I think there should be a, a, a separate group of referees, and, and even if that means using referees that are recently retired, mm. because there's no physical element to it. There's yeah. nothing to stop, you know, a 78 year old referee <laughs> who knows the rules and the laws of the game uh, from doing that job in the VAR room. So I think that group of, of referees that do the VAR stuff should be completely separate from the group of referees that do the refereeing on the pitch because. It's all about conflicts of interest mm. because you're getting a referee on a pitch and a referee in the VAR room who are good mates. Right. Right. Yeah. Now, if your mate is on the pitch, you're not going to want to make him yeah. look bad. So you're going to do everything you can to protect him. And that's not how it should be. It should be no conflict of interest here. So you have a separate group of referees who don't really know this group of referees. And then there's no personal conflict of interest that can come into it and they do the job objectively and if you do that along with having a former player in the room to bounce things off of um, in certain situations I think those two things could make the process a a lot better Uh, and I also think you should also be able to in real time like they do in rugby you should be able to hear the conversations that are going on when they're talking about the, the issues because I think it's really unfair that the fans in the ground that pay money to go and watch the game and who are effectively supporting the game, propping it all up, because if if stadiums were empty, the TV companies wouldn't want to know about it. The advertisers wouldn't want to know about it. So they're propping things up, but they're not getting as good an experience as the people who are sat at home watching it on the telly because they're Mm. seeing the replays uh, and then Mm. listening to the commentators talk about, you know, Mm. what process they might be going through. So I think everything really, and with the technology available in this day and age, you should be able to hear those conversations in real time in the stadium and on the stadium screens. They should be able, to, they should be showing those incidents so everyone can see what's going on. Yeah. Transparency is kind of what it all boils down to. Transparency and, and no conflicts of interest. And if you have that, then I think people would more readily accept, you know, the occasions when a referee might make a, a mistake. Possibly, yeah. but I think you would definitely reduce the amount of mistakes that that would happen if you implemented those things. Yeah, those incentive structures are so key to everything. As you're saying, they don't want to make their mate look like a plonker, so they're not going to say things. Yeah. Likewise, you said about players rolling around on the floor. Um, I don't know the data on it, but I'm pretty confident that if they didn't do that, 
the player that had just fouled them would be less likely to get a yellow card. So that's why they do it, because the incentive is there yeah. to um, yeah. to take that action. So, I mean, that the diving issue could be sorted so easily, so easily. Um, the, the, the yellow card should come out a lot more way more way yeah. more than it does yeah. I mean we're watching VAR decisions and, and they're going no it's not a penalty he hasn't touched him okay which means <laughs> yeah. he's dived so <laughs> yeah. tell the referee yellow card him because he's dived and they're not doing it yeah. they're just going oh no contact carry on <laughs> right so you're just going to let him dive and get away with it yeah uh, so that if they start doing that properly you will eradicate diving yeah Especially if you if you uh, make it a cumulative process. So if you if somebody mm-hmm. starts doing it once and they get a yellow card, if they do it the next time, even if it's in a in another game, yeah. not even in the same game, if you're on a yellow card for diving and you do it again in the next game, you're going to get a red card. Oh, you carry away. it over. Yeah, interesting. You carry it over. Yeah, yeah. That stops diving immediately. Yeah. And yeah. It's, and and it's just a really simple thing to implement and yet they won't do it I always think of a similar situation when players are absolutely mobbing the referee and shouting in their face I think you could, you could get rid of that in a weekend yeah bunch of cards it's yeah. just going to go away straight and they, away and they've done it on occasions they've brought in these things where they just go we're not going to accept it we're going to do it and they, and so they do it for a few weeks yeah 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 and then all of a sudden it kind of just <laughs> fizzles out and they just go back to how it was before and it's yeah. like oh geez here we go yeah yeah so you said, Ram, obviously we're seeing a lot more money in football. We're seeing state-owned clubs and things mm. like that. We're also seeing what seems to me a lot more power being transferred to players as opposed to clubs. You think of like the Mbappe example and the deal that he signed where he has so much control over over PSG. Yeah. Is that, um, is that something that the sport should be concerned about? Yeah, I think, think so. Uh, and it, it, it's, it's funny how everything kind of... <laughs> everything replicates in life because we're talking about the political situation there well years ago all the clubs held the power yep and now we've gone wow and the pendulum has <laughs> swung all the way all the over way. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. the player now has all the power if you're a really good player you yeah. have all the power uh, and again it all comes down to somewhere in the middle you know mm. having having that balance where you just find the place where okay, you have a little bit of a power and you have a little bit of a power and we come to meet in the middle. Um, and that's kind of, it kind of sums up where I feel like I I am, you know, politically and in most of my opinions, yeah. is that there is this, this bit in the middle where there's got to be a, a little bit of nuance and you can't have these, these extremes of right and left and just, can we not just all come together in the middle and be able to talk to each other like, grown men and women <laughs> and have adult conversations and have a little bit of give and take and sometimes it's okay to agree to disagree we're yeah. not all going to have the same opinion but let's do that respectfully <clears throat> and let's not fall out about it you know one of my one of my best mates I was best man for for my mate Laurie he has the complete opposite worldview that I have right now <laughs> that's complete great complete opposite <laughs> yeah we play golf two or three times uh, a, a week sometimes. And over the last three years, we've had some, you know, fairly reasonable debates on things. Yeah. And uh, on occasions, we may have raised a voice occasionally. Uh, but, you know, at the, end of that, <laughs> at the end of that conversation, we've both gone, oh, well, <laughs> I'll see you tomorrow. We'll, we're teeing off at nine tomorrow. Shake hands. Yeah. I'll see you tomorrow. We'll have, a, we'll have another game of golf. Yeah. And that's that's how it should be. Yeah. You know, yeah. even though you're polar opposites, you should still be able to agree to disagree on things. Have a debate. If you don't agree, fine. Move on. Crack on. Let's go on with it. That sounds that sounds good to me. That sounds like a similar situation with me and my sister. We might we might do the same thing. But, but you know, family members do never yeah. speak to each other again over, and, over and issues what, like that. And that's then, uh, what really upsets me is that there, there are... There are families that have, have literally kind of split because of yeah. everything that's gone on over the last few years. And, and that is, I feel like, that has been deliberately provoked. Mm, okay, yeah. I feel, I, that's how I feel. The, the techniques that have been used to propagandize people have been used deliberately 
to sow division. Mm. And that's what really annoys me. Yeah. That's not good for anyone in the long no, run. No. One, no one at all. We should Everything that the government should do should be about bringing people together and finding ways to come together, find a... Uh, a, a common place where everybody can mm. can kind of get on and, and have conversations where okay you, you you might disagree but everything that came out with the covid stuff was all about sowing division the vaccinated against the unvaccinated the mask wearers against the non-mask wearers you know and all these all the psychological messaging that was put out about you know don't kill your granny you know get yeah. your vaccine don't get don't it was just the horrible, was pervasive. Used, yeah. It was just, and and there are there are government departments that specialise in that kind of stuff. Right. Okay. And that is what is so pervasive about it all is that it was done deliberately to to sow division, and I I I can't abide that. I, I hate yeah. that when people deliberately divide people on whatever issue it is, they will deliberately use the, the media to get people fighting against each other. Do you think social media also incentivizes that? I mean, we see that obviously politically, but you also see it within within football with the rise of football YouTube channels where they are seeming to me so over the... T- I don't know if you can see much of that stuff, but they're so no. over the top in their reactions. You know, their team loses or draws and they're calling for these players to leave and the manager's head and it just seems so over the top and staged in a lot of scenarios. Yeah, I mean, I think that stuff is uh, kind of best ignored, really. <laughs> um, I, I, I mean, I, I'm not against people having YouTube channels and having their opinions. Absolutely, have, have yeah. your opinion. That's fine. But... I mean, there are some times where you just think, you, know, you don't have to take in every bit of information and let it affect you. Yeah. Uh, you know, you let these things wash over you and let these people have their opinions, that's fine. And if people want to mouth off on YouTube, let <coughs> them do that. But at the end of the day, you're also free to ignore those opinions if they're absolute nonsense. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's what we should be able to do. Everyone have their opinion, but you also got the choice to go no mate you're talking rubbish i'm just going to ignore you <laughs> uh, sorry about that and that's and that's nothing to do with freedom of speech yeah. this is the other thing on social media that people go oh well you talk about freedom of freedom of speech but you just block that bloke <laughs> yeah. well yeah i've blocked him because he was being abusive towards me and i don't really need that in my life so i'm not stopping him from speaking yeah. i'm stopping listening to him yeah. there's a subtle difference there um, and that's what a lot of people don't don't kind of understand. The amount of people that go, "Oh, freedom of speech, you just blocked my mate." Yeah, well, that's that's two completely different things, mate. You don't really understand that. But anyway. yeah, freedom of speech is people can say what they want. It doesn't mean that everyone has to listen to it. Or... Exactly right. You have as the as the the person on the end of it, you have a decision whether you want to yeah. listen to it or not, and that's. And now with so many media options, you can, if you don't want to watch something, listen to something, yeah, not a problem. I, absolutely, I haven't I haven't watched the mainstream media news on television for about three years. Great, <laughs> my life's great because of it. My mental health is great because of it. Yes, yeah, it's the, amazing. The world, the world when you just live in the world seems a much happier, if friendlier I could place. Give any advice to anybody uh, that that would be something that could make their life a lot better it would be stop watching the news mm, yeah. on the mainstream media. It's just depressing and it's just, oh, it's horrible. Um, and actually, real life amongst real people in your circles, you make your own life. Yeah. You can make you, of your life what you want it. And some, you can make your life as happy as you want it to be. And if something's that important, you'll find out anyway. Exactly. If you don't need to know it exactly. first time. I definitely agree with that. And um, before we um, before we end, I wanted to ask a few sort of Quicker fire questions. Obviously. Yeah, take as long it. as you want with with answers and things like that. No problem. Um, in twenty years' time, are we all going to be following the Saudi Arabian League and supporting Saudi teams as opposed to the Premier League? No. <laughs> okay. Do you think that's a bit of a flash in the pan and is going to disappear swiftly? Or I, I think it will possibly go the same way as the Chinese one did when they were throwing yep. all the money around for a okay. few years and. Um, you know, this is this is a project that, that's going on, but I, I mean, seriously, it, it's going to be very difficult to try to compete with uh, leagues that have over a hundred years of yeah. 
uh, of experience and uh, history behind them to try and usurp those leagues and get everybody following it. It's going to be really difficult no matter how much money you throw in. I think China proved that. Yeah. And we've seen some of the numbers of like stadiums are not as full as uh, not, as we may have expected, no, given no. the players that have been signed. And I mean, have you like watched that. any of the Saudi League games? I have not. <laughs> no, I can't say I have. I, I have. No, I've seen clips of goals I mean, from I'm very sure famous players online, and that is it. I'm sure they'll try to uh, beat us into uh, <laughs> uh, trying to watch it, even if you know you don't want to. You're going to be propagandized to to go. You must watch this. It's great. It's really good. You know like they're doing with the women's football yeah yeah um is it possible for a professional footballer at, at, at the highest level let's say a premier league player who is 18 19 20 now to be a normal person given the life that they have led to get to that point it's possible um i think with good grounding good parents good people around you it's possible okay um uh, and and not to let things kind of go to your head I do, I do get a little bit concerned about how football clubs, you know, kind of treat their players, and um, I think they give them a, a, a false sense of just how important they are. Yeah, okay. in the grand scheme of things. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I think that's something that could do with football clubs could do better. Mm. Um, so it is possible. If I think the answer would be if you've got the right people around you. Yeah, I, I, I can only imagine had I, <laughs> had I known from you know because I imagine a lot of these guys will know from early teen years that they're going to be good enough, they're going to be a pro, they're going to make a lot of money. How the almost godlike status some of these kids must get at schools and things along those lines. Yeah, how I, th- that would I think the you. one thing that I would I would kind of just instill in these in these kids who do have that kind of attitude is that I would I would just make them think that every day it only takes one tackle yeah one injury yeah and everything you dreamed about is gone mm. so be humble and don't get carried away yeah yeah and um, what players do you find really exciting what sort of younger players are you really excited to see over the next 10 years or so um i, I really like uh watching phil foden play obviously mm. he's he's probably getting on a bit now into his early 20s <laughs> um, but he, he's he's one that I, I like watching Kevin De Bruyne uh, is, is obviously a, an older player but again somebody who I like watching Cole, Port, uh, Cole Palmer at Chelsea yeah. I think has got some good potential there mm. um, I kind of like what he's done um, and the attitude that he he displays I quite like that Um I think in terms of kind of young English talent, Jude Bellingham for me is mm. just wow. I mean, I went and watched him up at Wembley, the England Italy game, mm. first time I'd watched him play actually in person, and I was so I couldn't have been more impressed. Honestly, he was just all over the place. He got I didn't see any weakness in his game. Yeah, um, and so he is a he's one for me. He's absolutely massive. Going to be a huge player for England going forward and almost the kind of player almost in a Gaza like mm. uh, situation where you feel like he could almost take us to, to win in a, a tournament on his own yeah that kind of scarily good yeah um, and, and I hope that you know he continues his development and what he's doing at Real Madrid this season is just ridiculous amazing he seems when I watch him play he seems like a, a man playing with boys he seems like a, a yeah. 16 year old playing with 12 year olds just on, a, got, on another level he's got that attitude if somebody's so young he is yeah. not afraid to dig out an older player in the team yeah. you know even in the national team yeah um, he is not afraid he's got a great attitude and I can see I can see why Kind of Birmingham thoughts so highly of him that they retired his shirt when he left. <laughs> at the time, I was left going sixteen. <laughs> are you sure? How the hell are you playing that? It was quite a gamble Retiring at that point. Retiring the shirt, <laughs> and then uh, and now I'm going. Oh, okay. Fair <laughs> enough. Somebody saw something, but, yeah. and uh, yeah. So uh, um, I think he is the one for me. Yeah. Are England going to win the Euros? The only way, the only reason I hesitate there is that I would, I think we have the ability to do that. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure we have the right manager to do it. Okay. I think right. we have the players. Uh, I, I think we've been 
put in two situations where we could have won big tournaments. And I think the lack of... I don't want to say I don't want to say bottle. It might be bottle from the manager to actually go on and and really take that game by the scruff of the neck and you know one it up against Croatia in the semi final of the World Cup, kind of sat back a little bit, almost invited them onto us. Yeah. Um, you know they were a good team, not a great team, uh, but I thought we invited them on and, and uh, allowed ourselves to get beat in that game. And I think the same thing happened in the final against Italy in the Euros, where we go one nil up after a couple of minutes. We had them on the ropes. Could quite easily, if we'd have really gone for them in that first half, got that game won by half time. Yeah. Uh, and he n- never really did that. Um, and I think, I think, had we had a more experienced, a better tactical manager, um, I think we would have won at least one of those tournaments. I mean, player for player in both those scenarios, the England team's head and shoulders above. Um, yeah, yeah it, it's interesting that with the Gareth Southie situation, it seems that because England have underperformed for so many years, for so long, having someone that perhaps achieved close to par was seen as massive yeah, progress. I think that's a really good way of putting it. And, and not being able to take that next step it, in... In both those scenarios, as soon as we came up against a, a good team, that was that was it, really. Yeah, I, I think given the fact that you know Gareth can say, "Oh, I got to a semi final World Cup, I got to final of the Euros." Um, the way I look at it is, how many other managers could have done that? Yeah, I think I think with those players. I think I could probably have done that. <laughs> yeah. You know, the qualifying yeah. campaigns are, are, are a cakewalk, really, yeah, let's yeah, be yeah. honest. Um, and with the teams that we kind of beat along the way, I feel like he didn't really do anything that kind of, anything special that warranted, you know, any kind of great praise. Um, I think we've done, I think I think you put it perfectly, it, it, it's about par. Mm, with the teams yeah. that we've played against, that's the least we should have yeah. we should have done. Yeah. Um so I I, I like Gareth as a, as a as a as a bloke. Obviously I played against him and played with him a little bit in England. Uh and he's a nice bloke. Mm. Um didn't agree with his stance on encouraging kids to get vaccines. Uh I've mm. always disagree with the with him on that. Um but as a bloke, nice bloke, um, you know, not not nasty in any way. Um, but I, I just I don't think he's quite got that extra bit um, to be a kind of top draw manager that will take us to winning a trophy. I hope I'm wrong. <laughs> Me too. I hope, <laughs> I hope next year uh, that I come back and they go, oh, you don't know what you're talking about because I would love it if, if England won a major tournament. You know, I haven't ever yeah. seen that in my lifetime. Yeah, yeah. I was two years too late for, <laughs> for 1966 and all that. So, uh, so yeah, I, I'd hope before I pack my bags from this planet that I get to see us win a major trophy. That, that would be fun. Um, looks like we've got an exciting Premier League title race on this season. Yeah. Do you think we will have one that goes to the wire and I hope who's your so. money on? It, it, it's looking that way. I mean, that yeah. top of the league at this at this time of the season, normally the, the wheat's been sorted from the chaff and yeah. it's normally a two-horse race. Um, so for it to be as tight as it is at the moment, I think it's... Shaping up to be one of the most fascinating Premier League titles we've ever had. Yeah, um, you know, especially if if a team like Villa continue the form that they're on, um, if Spurs can get back into it. I mean, you're looking at at five teams there who probably at this stage of the season realistically think, "Blimey, we've got a chance." Um, yeah, which hasn't happened for for quite some time. So, how do I see it panning out? I mean. You're hard pressed, Man City. You got De Bruyne coming back in January. That's going to be massive for them. Uh, they'll probably go and win their last 14 games of the season again, and, <laughs> as and, per. and win the title by six or eight points. But um, I don't know. I think I think this season it could be a lot closer. I think mm-hmm. Liverpool and Arsenal um, will have a bigger say. Uh, and you know, Faster Villa continue their home form alone is just incredible. Is it 15 home wins in the, yeah. on the spin, which is just magnificent form so Emery is really pulling up trees there um, so yeah I think I think it will be a, a much tighter title race I'd be hard pressed to back against Man City even in the position they're in at the moment yeah. given that they'll have 
De Bruyne back and if they get everybody fit I mean they are capable of doing it. there's not many teams that are capable of stringing together 12, 13, 14 wins in a row but yeah. they can as long as they keep Rodri fit I think the uh, stats would say uh, yeah he's a pretty important player for them and he is I mean if you have Rod- Rodri and De Bruyne in the middle of that midfield yeah <laughs> that's special I mean <laughs> you ain't going to lose many games if you have to um, obviously you worked Sky for a long time who are your favourite pundits uh, working now um, I, I really liked Graham Sooners. Oh yeah, okay. I, I thought Graham told it as it was. Yeah. Um, obviously he left uh, last season. Last season, yeah. Um, but I enjoyed listening to him. Um, I, I, I really enjoy actually listening on on football matters of all sorts. Um, actually, to Simon Jordan. Okay. Yeah. Uh, on Talksport, I, I think he speaks a lot of sense about a lot of issues. Um, so I, I find him quite enjoyable. Um, uh, Gary Gary Neville, uh, I find most of the time is, is pretty good. I think sometimes he, he, he allows his, his Man United colours to shine through a little bit too much. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but on quite a lot of topics, uh, I, I quite enjoy listening to him. Um, but yeah, that's, that's about it. Jamie Carragher's not one. I was, was going to say, he doesn't, <laughs> he, he doesn't, he doesn't make it on the list, does he? <laughs> no, no, his voice annoys me. <laughs> um, <laughs> do you think you were underrated as a player and should you have had more England caps? Do I think I was underrated as a player? Uh, but uh, so that, that's, that question needs to be kind of... By who? Folk, yeah. Yeah, okay. So was I underestimated by the Southampton fans no yeah uh, was I underestimated by England managers yes I think I was should I have had more England caps I think I sh- I should have given my form given what I was doing at Southampton I should have been given more opportunities to win more England, England caps so I only started I, I'll qualify that I started three matches for England uh, one was abandoned after 27 minutes in uh, Dublin for crowd trouble right. uh, and the other two starts that I had were three years apart mm. now given that I during the 93-94 season scored 25 league goals that season and the following season I scored 30 goals uh, in all competitions if you'd have had a player now an Englishman now doing that in the Premier League yeah not only would he be getting more opportunities in England squads, he'd be the first name on the team sheet probably. Um, so looking back, I felt like I could have been given a few more opportunities mm. to see whether I was good enough to play at international level. Mm. I don't think I was given a fair crack of the whip. Now, had the manager given me 10 or 12 games and I didn't produce, then I'd go, well, maybe international football wasn't for me. You can't say I wasn't good enough for international football because I wasn't given enough of, a, of an opportunity to, to play at that level. Yeah, okay. Who's going to win the next Ballon d'Or and will he be English? Jude Bellingham, yes. <laughs> Why not? I mean... Harry Kane, maybe? I mean, early Haaland's probably going to yeah, be up yeah. there. Uh, Harry Kane um, carries on scoring the volume of goals. I mean, obviously, the, the goal scorers are always the ones that get... Yeah, yeah. And, that, and then it's kind of... I've kind of disagreed with this a little bit when it comes to the Ballon d'Or because they're kind of picking from, you know, you've either got to be in a team that wins the Champions League or a World Cup yeah, uh, for you to even be considered. Um, and I can understand why Erling Haaland was frustrated last year. Yeah. Because given the numbers that he put up in terms of the goals that he scored, um, you'd have thought that he'd have been somewhere a little bit closer than he was to, to winning that. Um, but yeah, I'd love to see an, an Englishman win it. I think Kane or Bellingham would be, would be amazing. I mean, what the numbers both those boys are putting up this season have been brilliant very exciting for England I guess as you say it probably depends on how the Champions League goes you know as, as, it, as it often does yeah fab well thank you so much Matt for coming and uh, speaking with me much appreciated um, if people it. want to find out more information about you mentioned your Twitter handle what was that again uh, at MattLatis7 and then anywhere else you want to send people is there uh, a specific... I've got a website uh, mlt7.com fab, um, where okay. you can sign up to my newsletter that I do every fortnight now uh, and find out what uh, what goes on in my life a little bit more um, and any interviews and podcasts that I've done 
most of them are on that website if you want to catch up with any of those awesome thank you so much for for coming to see me and um it's been a real pleasure to, to speak to you a bit of a pinch myself moment for me oh, being able to speak to someone Thanks, that mate. i've watched on tv for so many years and that sort of thing so, thank you mate yeah. so what did you think of my conversation with matt please let me know in the comments below please also don't forget to like and subscribe and if you want to watch another one of my videos you can watch it right here